Welcome to the Curious Advantage podcast, an exploration of the idea of curiosity and its increasing importance for thriving in the digital age from the authors of The Curious Advantage. In this episode, Paul Ashcroft, Simon Brown, and Garrick Jones, authors of the book The Curious Advantage, introduce the power skill of curiosity, looking at the impact of curiosity as a driver of value for the global firm Novartis, while introducing their model Sailing the Seven Seas of Curiosity. The guest host for this edition is Nina Bressler Murphy. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Curious Advantage podcast series. I'm Nina Bressler Murphy. I'm the head of Enterprise Capability at Novartis. I'm your guest podcast host today, and I'd like to start by introducing my three guests. So let's start with my colleague, friend, and unboss, Simon Brown, the Chief Learning Officer at Novartis. This time last year, we could not have imagined the magnitude of energy, creativity, and curiosity that could have been unleashed in an organization such as Novartis. We were at the beginning of a journey to go big on learning, and what has come to life over the past year has people all over the world asking, what's happening at Novartis? Simon is here to tell us about the Novartis journey and give us some insights on how we've unleashed the power of our people by nurturing curiosity. Hi, everyone. Hi, Nina. Uh, Great to be here on today's podcast. So Novartis is a focused medicines company uh, with just over 100,000 people located all around the world. We focus on improving and extending patients' lives. And last year, we touched nearly 800 million patients around the world. We do that through our strategy, which has five pillars. Number one pillar of that strategy is around unleashing the power of our people. And to unleash the power of our people, we've been on a two-year journey to transform our culture we have a culture aspiration around being inspired, curious, and unbossed. And that's the link to curiosity for today. So over the last two years, we've focused on how we inspire curiosity across our associates. And hopefully over the course of this podcast, I'm going to share some of the things that we've been up to. Next, let's meet the two gentlemen who so kindly traded places with me to become guests. Garrick Jones and Paul Ashcroft are the founders of the Ludic Group and visionaries about what it means to thrive in the digital age. Hi, Nina. This is Garrick. Simon, Paul, and myself are the three authors of The Curious Advantage. And we're absolutely delighted that you agreed to be our guest host because we wanted to present the book as the three authors and have somebody interview us the way that we normally interview everyone else in the podcast. Why is curiosity important to thriving in the digital age? Well, I know Paul has his perspective, but from my perspective, it's all about other people and connecting with other people. And the way that we learn about new things and the way that we take ideas forward are through connecting with other networks where new ideas may thrive from that connection or existing ideas may be learned that are there before. But we need new people. We need to connect with them in order to go into new areas. And hi, Nina, great to be here with you. When we were researching this book on curiosity, I think what we found most fascinating is how people often start their lives feeling curious and being curious, but in some way along the way feel that they can't be anymore or that curiosity is not part of their lives. And we were fascinated by this and also how some of the organisations, and Novartis being a great example of one, is really using curiosity to their advantage and some of the results they've been seeing. Why is it essential for today's world, Nina? I think the important thing is that we have this enormous resource, the internet, which has you know, the potential to have infinite access to all the knowledge that's in the world today. The question is, what do you do with it and what do you do when you're faced with it? And for us, the practice of curiosity or being curious in an active exploratory way that allows you to be safe and build confidence and connect with people. That practice of being curious is one of the key learning skills or power skills, we call it in the book, to enable us to make sense of this world and to move through it and and to use it to our best advantage. And Garrick, what actually makes you curious? I'm curious about many, many things. I always have been since I was a child. I got into trouble occasionally. 
Uh, but I think that when I when I think about it, the thing that makes me most curious, other than other people, is history. I'm fascinated in what we can learn from history, the great um, millennium that have been in the past, the great epochs, the great empires. You know, there, there are things about history and moments in history where everything has been turned on its head, and yet humans have done astonishing feats um, to achieve things. And it's that kind of stuff that makes me really curious. And I'm always on the hunt for new uh, stories and historical stories. Great. And uh, Simon, what makes you curious? So I've spent the last 20 years playing in the uh, in the learning and development world. So my curiosity tends to focus around learning new ways of learning, new ideas. Um, so there's a, there's a fantastic learning community out there um, and trying to uh, find the ideas across that community, um, whether that's through LinkedIn, whether that's through news, whether that's through podcasts, whether that's through interest groups with others in similar situations, uh, always looking for uh, curious, I guess, around what's that new idea out there or that new thing that can help and then apply that into the situation within Novartis of how we support our associates. And Paul, I'd love to hear from you as well. What makes you curious? What I'm most fascinated by at the moment is how fast our society has been changing. So Gary talked about history and Simon's talking about sort of some of the innovations in technology, but the impact on how that is changing not just the way we learn, but the way we work, the way we interact with each other um, and what that has opened up, uh, not just personally, but even for my children and the type of world that they're going to live in. So all the things that are changing so fast around us uh, has been something that I've been fascinated by and exploring. And in that context, Paul, do you see any barriers to curiosity that um, arise for people? People are inherently are curious. We believe that and the research shows that but often confidence and a feeling of safety tends to start to erode away our curiosity so when we don't feel confident in a situation certainly i can i i feel that or in some way if i don't feel safe or i'm in a very unfamiliar situation then that's where it's difficult to still be curious So in talking with you, I've heard you talk about um, an explorer mindset and also the pleasure centers in the brain that are activated. Could you talk to me a little bit about what happens when we're curious in our brains? What's absolutely fascinating is that curiosity seems to stimulate the same response in our brain as when we are anticipating a reward. So the reward pathways in our brain that are connected to release of dopamine, which is the chemical in the brain that makes us happy and want more. Um, like if we're anticipating receiving a prize or some food um, or in some way some pleasure. And curiosity does exactly the same thing to our brain. It makes us want more um, and creates that need um, to explore and to discover. So in some way, we are wired to be curious. I mean, I re always remember a story from when I was a kid. I must have been about five years old, and I was on a farm where everybody spoke a different language to the one I'd been brought up with, and I wanted to post a letter. And I went down on my bike to a post office where there was a counter that was too tall for me, and I found myself in a queue. And when I got to the front of the, the counter, I discovered I couldn't speak the language to make myself understood and um, post my letter. And I remember to this day that, that feeling of uh, unease and being stressful. But the thing that it did for me, which I, I immediately wanted to learn the language, I remember returning to the farm a year later, having got some language and posting a letter. And it's a really crazy thing in my life, which I think it had huge impact, but it really talks to me about that, the pleasure that was associated with learning that language enough to be able to post that letter and the feeling of euphoria I experienced when I did post that letter a year later, is something I carry with me today. It sounds like you started out as a little explorer and grew up into a big one. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Simon, I'm sure you see um, stories like this coming to life in business all the time. Can you think of anything from Novartis? Yeah, I mean, curiosity is, is essential for us as a, as a company that is 
constantly looking out for new medicines. So there are many ways that curiosity plays through and and has an advantage for us as a business. Um, the more we can can foster and encourage it. So whether that's from the the sort of start of a drug's life, where we're looking at thousands of molecules to identify which is the one molecule that will have an impact on a particular disease and be able to uh, ultimately go through to cure it. And there's a there's a huge element around curiosity to be able to discover that and uh, take that through the process. And then you know, e even then at later stages in our process, um, we've seen recent curiosity in our manufacturing area where um, colleagues were, were curious around finding better ways of how we package up the medicines to be able to support people in how they take them and reminding them to be able to take those medicines. And then one that will be relevant for, for so many businesses out there is if we, we're looking forward to the future, then there's so much ambiguity out there around the impact of digital, the impact of automation, AI, so many unknowns. It's very difficult to know, you know which are the, going to be the critical skills, which are going to be the, the areas that um, are going to be most in demand. And therefore, if we're looking at curiosity across a workforce, you know, that curiosity will be able to be applied to wherever the future goes. So encouraging a workforce that is curious uh, is almost a uh, an insurance policy against where the future where the future goes because uh, curious people will be able to build whatever skills are necessary um, to be able to work in that that unknown future and I think that really takes us to kind of the thinking that curiosity is sometimes the human need to resolve uncertainty Garrick or Paul could you talk to me a little bit more about that the whole idea of uncertainty and resolving uncertainty goes back to some of the fight or flight ideas that we have as innate um, human beings built into us that uh, we're always seeking to be safe and we're seeking to ensure that we are safe in situations. And from babies, we grow up trying to learn as much about the world as possible, the context around us in order to ensure our, our, our safety. However, the danger as we get adults is we start to believe more and more that the world is a particular way and that we've got it figured out and we know how it works. And it, it only takes, you know, you to walk in the wilds if you come from the city or to go to a farm if you've never been one or, or to go to a place where they have animals and insects that you've not encountered before to suddenly realise that um, you don't have the language or the skills to be able to navigate in that situation. And so then you get into... Um, a situation where your brain is firing off neurotransmitters to lay down new pathways and to learn further. But actually going back to something that Paul touched on at the beginning, all the time um, we hear that people are actually deterred from being curious. So for example, last year when I was preparing the Curiosity Chapter campaign at Novartis, and I would tell people the name of the campaign, they would laugh at the title and say, oh, well, you know, curiosity killed the cat. So are we telling ourselves and our children to actually avoid being curious because we believe that that might be dangerous? And is that a limiting belief that we need to overcome? In Renaissance times and we and before, curiosity was actually deemed to be a dangerous thing. People weren't encouraged to explore, to be different, uh, to try things new. We perhaps take it for granted these days that at least in most societies, being, a, being creative and being curious is encouraged um, and, and to be supported, but it wasn't always that way. And perhaps that's where, that's where that comes from, this limiting belief that actually trying and testing is actually bad for you. I think it's interesting because for many years we were trying to you know, drive, if, if we look at, I guess, the industrial revolution and manufacturing, we we're trying to drive to standardization and almost people as a as part of a machine of doing the same thing over and over and over again. And in today's world, it's, it's as we were saying, it's so ambiguous now that uh, you can't just repeat a process over and over and over again because things are moving so fast. So you need that curiosity to be able to um, to deal with the unknown and to be able to to navigate through what's coming. Um, as part of our pursuit of curiosity within Novartis, we actually focused a, a whole quarter, um, three months last year, around curiosity with a whole series of uh, events and, and activities uh, that took place across the, the company. That culminated in our uh, learning month, as we call it, which was, was four weeks focused around um, learning and, and really strengthening that curiosity. And that included over 250 events in different 
different locations around the world. It included over 130 global webinars, um, and we had over 30, 34,000 people actually en enroll on those. So there's massive uptake across the, the company. Uh, I had over 100,000 hours of, of learning. So the reason for doing that was really to um, invite people to be curious and, and going back to your, your opening question there and you know, curiosity killed the cat is to change the mindset around actually, no, we, we want people to be curious because there's a huge business value in, in having a workforce that is curious. And I guess I would ask, do you see curiosity as an inherent trait that we're born with or something that can be learned? I think we absolutely do believe that curiosity can be learned. It is in some way something we are born with, as we talked about, we're programmed to be curious, but it is a skill. And when we've spoken to people, we found that they said, well, I'm, I wonder about this. I, I'm interested in jazz. I'm interested in um, mountain bike riding, but then I didn't really ever get to go and do it. And we think that there is actually a, a way and a, and a set of things that people can do that will enable them to be more successfully curious in their lives. I'd love to talk about them in just a minute, but before we talk about that, could you um, come back and tell me about some other examples that you've seen where building a curious culture has really enabled an organization or a society to um, improve or transform the way they work in some way? I'm very interested in social cultures who organize themselves around curiosity, two of which we talk about in the book. The first one is the Venetian Republic, which absolutely was committed to creating itself almost as a machine for exploration. They had organized themselves to build ships very quickly, powerful. They organized themselves to have um, money and investing to enable to fund these, these voyages. They had all the 16 sestieri in, in Venice sorted amongst the families and the hierarchies and the traders to quickly put all of these um, uh, voyages together. And they, had, and they protected the routes to, to the east where they were able to trade and then bring back things and trade them in turn at great expense. The entire culture was built around um, schooling and education and learning around certain areas to make sure that um, knowledge was constantly improving. And the famous scuole in, in, in Venice were places of high learning where people would be part of almost secret societies, which would just take the learning about navigation, shipbuilding, map making, strategy, the weather, um, uh, geography, uh, warfare, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, on and on, so that this entire uh, society built on the water at the height of its power was just a curiosity machine in, in our respects. And from a Novartis perspective, so we've been on a culture journey now for two years, um, and the number one uh, priority for the company has been around unleashing the power of our people, which is moving towards this culture around inspired, curious, and unbossed. And as part of that, we're looking at ways for how do we measure curiosity so we can, you know, without doubt, then make the linkages between culture, curiosity, uh, and business performance. And that will take probably longer than a two-year period to be able to make that link. Uh, However, what we are seeing is some of the metrics that go into curiosity, so something like the uh, amount of time that people are spending on learning. Um, between 2018 and 2019, we saw over a 50% increase in the amount of learning hours on average that people are doing across the company. So that's actually after three years of declining hours, we then saw a, a massive spike. Uh, and and that then correlates through, we can see how that curiosity and that increased time of people spending learning ties through to building key skills. So we can see a, an increase in key skills around things like data visualization, data management, which are, are absolutely critical. Uh, and then we also see that there was a, a fantastic performance from the company financially last year. So we can't make the the absolute link between those, but we can see that uh, you know, a change in culture over two years uh, has led to certain key metrics changing um, and that coincides with a, a very strong performance from the company. There's another part of uh, this research that we need to keep an eye on because uh, it is early days yet as, uh, yet, as Simon says. The key thing for me is about diversity. We know that there is a direct link between the diversity in a system and the value that is being generated, and that's being shown more and more 
by research that the more diverse and open the system, the more it's able to generate uh, value because it's more able to be innovative. But we also know that there is a link between curiosity and diversity. And the diversity of a system allows it to be richer in terms of people's experience and so on. And the richer the environment, we believe, the the more powerful the curious um, impacts will be. So do you think it would be fair to say that um, curiosity is essentially a simple rule for complex times? I love the idea of simple rules that have complex outcomes. And the vital few is something uh, that's been talked about in the past. And we know about, you know, beehives, for example, thrive uh, and, and manage to self-regulate based on very few rules, like seven rules or so, things like feed each other, tell each other where the food is, keep it at a particular temperature, protect the queen if you get too big, um, bifurcate and swarm and, and so on. And these simple rules, I think, apply in society too. And I believe that um, simple rules such as curiosity uh, is a vital power skill um, that we need uh, for all of us to be able to to deal with um, the information that we face with and to be able to make powerful decisions and get great experience for moving forward into a future that we all want to enjoy. Maybe if I can build on that as well, Garrett, because uh, there was a talk I gave recently where we were talking around soft skills being the new power skills and then curiosity actually being the, the sort of supercharger of those power skills. And that was based on, on five elements. So one was uh, research around how curiosity actually helps you learn better. Uh, that came from the, the University of California, and that comes back to what Paul was saying um, earlier around the, the hippocampus and the, the reward part of the brain. And if you link uh, learning Learning with curiosity, it actually has a, a greater impact on um, your, your attention. Uh, then there was research through in the, that was referenced in the Harvard Business Review around how curiosity powers up your decision making. It actually reduces conflict and it boosts communication skills. Uh, and then the final piece was uh, in SEAD research, and that talks about how if you're curious, it actually drives greater innovation. So they've been able to make a link. It's not surprisingly that the more curious you are, actually the more innovative you are. So it builds on broader power skills to really sort of supercharge a whole range of skills. You're listening to the Curious Advantage podcast, inspired by the book, The Curious Advantage, written by Paul Ashcroft, Simon Brown, and Garrick Jones. Subscribe to the podcast today. Well, guys, you've done it. (laughs) You've really converted me. I am a believer that curiosity is critical. And I've heard you mention um, in passing the seven C's of curiosity. So we have today our, I think, fairly well agreed seven C's, the the Arctic, the North Atlantic, South Atlantic, the Pacific, the Indian, Southern Oceans. But when we delved into this, we found that actually all societies all seafaring societies had their own version of their seven seas. Uh, the, the Chinese had the seas and the rivers around their lands. The Mediterranean people had the seas around the, the Arabian, the Baltics, the Black Sea, and so on. In some ways, society seems to define itself around the seas and the seven seas in particular that is nearby them. And when we were thinking about curiosity, we discovered that there seemed to be seven seas, but in this case, seven Things beginning with the letter C. Well, there were five. Remember this, Simon? There were five, and then we we kind of crowbarred the last two in, but then we find they worked. It did work, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not a geography lesson, though, right? No, it's a bunch of it's a lot of serendipity, but it was a lot of fun to get to. I have to tell you, and it's proving it more more and more useful as a as a learning tool. Would you mind giving me a quick rundown of all of the seven C's of curiosity? So our seven C's are context, community, curation, creativity, construction, criticality, and finally, confidence. So the first C is context, right? So um, who wants to tell me a little bit about why context is so important for curiosity? When you write about context, it's almost impossible to define because context, and it means with text or with language, is 
the stuff that we are surrounded by in terms of ideas and concepts and meanings. And that's unutterably complicated. The thing about context is we have to inhabit context and we also have to explore and learn about context. For example, if I want to be a jazz musician, there's a whole history of jazz and there's a whole bunch of language around jazz and there's a whole sort of hierarchy of a network of people who live in, and thrive in the, in the jazz world. There's a whole theory of jazz musicianship that you have to know. It's a lot. But you have to enter through other people and you, you kind of have to be let into this world and then the context, the contextual information starts to inhabit your neuroscientific brain, right? And then the same is true for new stuff. New context is things that may haven't, haven't been laid down before. You might be an artist, you might be an innovator, and you're trying to find some solution which has never been um, found before. And you're looking all over the place in many different multidisciplinary areas, and you start to make connections, and you start to make connections that are viable in your new situation. And you create essentially new context to do so. So the idea of curiosity and going into context and going to places you haven't been before is absolutely vital. And Simon, how does that idea of finding context play out in the context of an organization like Novartis that's trying to reimagine medicine? So maybe one example would be if we look at the, the patient experience. So when we are um, working through a new medicine, um, we need to understand the, the experience that an existing patient would go through. So what's the context of someone who is suffering from a particular disease? Um, what is it that they're experiencing? And what are the, the things that um, we need to alleviate? And when it comes to designing that new solution, we really need to understand that context um, incredibly thoroughly. So. Uh, how we design that medicine and how that medicine may be administered. Uh, there's lots of different uh, ways that that can happen, but without understanding the context, we may not choose the solution that is actually uh, most effective. So it, it may be having uh, that we need to design that as a pill, or it may be it's an injection, or it may be it's something else. Without understanding the context and the the way that the patient is actually experiencing the disease, we may end up with uh, applying our curiosity in the wrong direction and ending up with a solution that doesn't work. That's so interesting. And I really also love the idea that communities then build on that context and use their um, diverse perspectives to drive solutions. And I know community is your next 7C. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? Curiosity we found is powered by community. Being curious by yourself really just doesn't work or certainly won't work for very long. Um, to be able to fully explore something, we need to be with others. So, And these others in the community play different roles. So we may have uh, teachers, friends, uh, guides, people who are able to connect us to other parts of that area of knowledge that we need to explore. Um, in essence, uh, the idea of social learning and experimenting is in the heart of creating a culture of curiosity. And that's why we think community is such an important element of being successfully curious. Do you guys have any um, great examples of how curiosity in a community brought something really extraordinary to life? So there's a, an example within Novartis, which is going back a little while now, um, where we were curious around solving a problem in Africa around um, stocks of medicines. Um, and we're finding issues whereby um, in, in rural Africa, um, it was very difficult to track um, what stocks of medicines were in different uh, health centers or hospitals. Um, and the curiosity of the team led them to come up with a solution that we called SMS for Life. And it was a a very simple way of using uh, SMS messages to be able to keep track of stockouts and be able to order new uh, new medicines. Uh, that was back in 2009 originally, um, and now fast forward, it's across many countries in uh, Africa and even extended beyond. And over 10,000 uh, health facilities are using the output of that curiosity of this SMS for life to be able to keep track very very simply around the the stocks of medicines and make sure we don't run out of key, particularly anti-malaria medicines to be able to uh, to support people there. 
That is such a great example of focusing your curious energy and curating where it goes. And curation is actually the next C. Yes, very nice. So great, Nina. <laughs> 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 so, done. Yeah, cu curation is um, is really interesting. What we find is that if you have established a context, so I want to explore a topic, I'm interested in music. I start to build a community you're interested in a particular type of music. And then I find I want to focus in because, hey, music is a massive world. I'm interested in jazz. Actually, I'm interested in acid jazz in the 1980s. You start to then curate the content and the people and the tools you need around you in order to explore that particular area. Now, as you go on and explore further, you may come back and curate further and change that body of knowledge and that group that you're working with. But this continual process of curation is really important. And a side note to curation is technology is really helpful in this regard. Mm. So as we're seeing AI tools and other tools come on stream that are helping to filter and curate for us. Think of our Netflix experience or our online shopping experience where the channels we use know our preferences and start, helpfully or not, to curate <laughs> the experience that they give us. So I was going to um, to bring up some of the, the curation. We actually had some of our, what we called influencers from across the company do as part of the curiosity chapter that I referred to earlier. So um, I guess where people are experts in their particular area to help others in their curiosity, we, we empowered a set of influencers to be able to curate playlists and uh, bringing together a variety of different resources that they could share out then into uh, the community for people who are, are curious. That may be specific learning resources, maybe articles, it may be even links into uh, how to connect with the wider community to uh, explore that curiosity. Next in your list of seven C's is creativity. And I see a lot of curiosity also coming to life through people's creativity. We link, and particularly even in our book, we link the idea of creativity and construction. And together, we like to think of this as, a, as our curiosity engine. So it's the things that we do that allow us to explore, to have new ideas, that spark of creativity, but also by being in the real world, by making and doing and figuring things out, it informs our practices, it stimulates our curiosity, and we get further into the topic in a constructive way. So we see that those two disciplines of being creative and through construction is where is the power horse really of our career uh, of our curiosity would it be fair to say that creativity and construction are almost like a cr curiosity funnel yeah it's a nice way to think about it you have to engage the two at the same time and one informs the other it also funnel is an interesting word there because it implies in some way reduction and synthesis and that is part of the process we find is that as you're being curious, you, you're honing in, you have a particular question you're trying to address. How does this work? Why would this be in this way? Um, what's it like to live in a different country or in a different city? So by being in the world and exploring and finding out, you are funneling or focusing. But at the same time as things are funneling, you also need to keep things open. And that's the wonderful thing about the relationship between creativity and construction making things and learning by doing is going to really help you figure out what you were trying to achieve and what you know and what you don't know. The creativity enables you to keep things open and find solutions to the problems you face um, as you move through the, 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 um, the process. So it's, they, they kind of have a symbiotic relationship conceptually. That makes so much sense. I kn I'm sure that at Novartis, you have some favorite examples of this, Simon. Would you mind speaking to them? Yeah, so we have something called the, the Genesis Labs, and I guess that's playing a bit to both the creativity and the construction. So it's it's there to encourage uh, innovative ideas in our the research part of our business. Um, and it, it, to, to support and help people in coming up with those ideas, uh, there's a, a mechanism whereby once that idea is, if you like, uh, endorsed, you can then get time, resources, um, and, and expertise to be able to then carry that through. So that sort of plays to both the creativity and the construction piece to both uh, create an environment that uh, creates the creativity uh, and then once you have the creativity to be able to build on that idea to uh, to be able to take that through into actually acting upon it uh, and be able to put it into practice through the construction part. 
That's so interesting. Now, criticality is the next 7C, and I would love to hear your perspectives on that. If you had to design the MBA of the future in the digital world, I think critical thinking and criticality will be at the heart of that. Reason being is that critical thinking is something that investigative journalists do, for example, or great scholars, whereas they're able to investigate something and learn about something, but remain emotionally distant from it. People who are investigative journalists can go into situations, war-torn situations. They can meet people, develop trust with people, new networks, and so on. They can keep the distinction between the subjective and the objective. What I mean by that is they can go into a situation, learn some stuff, and know whether it's impacting them uh, emotionally or know whether it is truth or not truth as they investigate further. It's absolutely vital so that we are aware of all the elements of critical thinking, things like unconscious bias. We have to be very aware that we're not going down a rabbit warren of things that reinforce our belief of the world as it is, or that we're going down something that just gives us pleasure, but doesn't actually teach us something new. Critical thinking is about being open to being uncomfortable and knowing that when we are uncomfortable in those situations, it's probably telling us something about what we are learning. The idea of critical thinking is at the heart of being able to learn new things that have real impact in our lives personally. Uh, sometimes it's it's hard to be critical as well. So, and there, I think there's some some questions we can ask ourselves around this. And um, Lisa Bedell, who's the the author of the book uh, Kill the Company, is great at this, where she tries to turn it around to say, you know, what would actually kill off your company, and that then prompts a whole series of questions that that make you um, be critical around your ideas and and take your curiosity in a whole different dimension. That's a, an approach that we've applied with with great effect. And Simon, um, looking at the Novartis example, could you actually talk a little bit about how within our Unbossed Leadership Experience program, self-awareness and criticality is so key to becoming more conscious of your um, mind traps? Yeah, so uh, we have a, a program across our leaders to support what or it's called what we call um, the Unbossed Leadership Experience. Um, and as part of that, um, there's a big focus around self-awareness. So we can actually you know, look critically at what it is that we all do as leaders day in, day out to be able to improve. And there's ways we all need to improve. That starts with a, a 360 feedback. Uh, and then one's team actually goes through that to identify what's the one big thing that you need to work on and then over the course of a year um, the team helps you to actually work on that so it's it's really around self-awareness and bringing that criticality of uh, of looking back and finding things that that you can uh, be curious in your own behavior to improve and it's so great that you know you really have the team there to support you and i think it's actually a great segue to the last c which is confidence so Confidence is the last C, but in some ways it's the first C as well, because when we've been looking at confidence and its relationship with curiosity, we found you can't disconnect the two things. Confidence grows with curiosity, and at the same time, being curious builds our confidence. What's clear is without confidence, we, we utterly cannot continue to do the brave things, to explore, to discover, to connect with new people um, that curiosity requires. So it's, it's fascinating to think about the connection between the two. One of the things that we particularly explored is what gives us confidence then? And you think, well, just practicing and getting better at stuff makes us more confident. It makes us um, more certain that we're going to get on stage and give a good show. But actually, what we found is confidence doesn't come from just getting it right. It actually comes from getting it wrong. And so permitting yourself to have small failures, for example, if you were learning to climb up a, a rock wall, fall off every half a meter, every meter, safely, not, not too high, up. not too high, <laughs> but enough so it knows what it's like. To, you know what it's like to fail because it's the, it's the knowing what it's like to get it wrong is what really gives you the confidence to succeed and get it right. And that's what really underpins um, being curious throughout that sort of process and throughout the exploration. Simon, would you mind giving us one more example from Novartis where you've really seen um, psychological safety and come to life to give our leaders and our associates confidence in their work? 
I think you may be using one of the, the technology examples, actually. So we use um, VR in some of our training pieces, and uh, that allows people to be curious to be able to try out um, and, and learn how to do things, um, but in uh, a, a safe environment. Um, and that's something we, we found is a hugely effective way of building that confidence um, and, and plays to some of the things that Paul was just describing. So it's been great walking through the seven C's with you. If our listeners were to do one thing today to help them live curiosity, where would you advise that they start? So for me, it would be through curious questions. Um, and one of the most powerful ones of, of I wonder if or what if, um, and that then leads you open to all sorts of curious answers. My one thing would be start doing it in the real world. Just wondering doesn't get us very far at all. But by actually trying and putting it into practice, that's where our curiosity comes to life. And I think um, my one would be make new friends. Make new friends who do things that you are curious about because you will learn a lot from them. I love all of those. And I'm going to make sure that I am more conscious of putting them into practice on a regular basis. So thank you so much for allowing me to host this wonderful session of The Curious Advantage. It's been really insightful. Thank you for being such a great host. Thank you, Nina. Brilliant. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, everybody, for listening. This has been a episode of the Curious Advantage podcast series. I invite you all to join in the conversation online and subscribe to this podcast. Thank you for listening to the Curious Advantage podcast. Stay tuned for the next episode and keep exploring curiously. This podcast is produced by Aliki Palinelli and edited by John McGinty and Jill Damatak-Futter.